Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Martin Tosche from the European Central Bank. Uh, this afternoon, I have the pleasure to chair this um, very interesting uh, uh, session uh, spanning basically topics from uh, trade and uh, the rationality of firms uh, forecast up to uh, inflation uh, expectations and how uh, we can best measure them. So on my right here, I have uh, Mathieu Pedemonte from the uh, Fe Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, who will uh, present a paper on uh, expectations about uh, exchange rates and how they uh, affect uh, people's uh, decisions. Um, then next to Mathieu, I have uh, Pamela Giustinelli from uh, Bocconi University, who will uh, present a paper on uh, the uh, coherence of uh, firms uh, decisions and then I have uh, on the far right I have uh, Olga uh, Goldfein Frank from the Bundesbank who will uh, show a new method basically to elicit uh, inflation expectations um, and that's obviously with the topic of the of the conference a very uh, uh, very interesting and very uh, topical thing. Uh, so without further ado, I would give you the floor, Mathieu, and looking forward to your presentation. Uh, we have 20 minutes and then 10 minutes for Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for, for the organizers to, to put this paper in the program. This is joint work with uh, Martalena Delgado, Juan Herreño, and, and Mark Hofstetter. And what we try to do here is to try to understand a little bit um, what is the effect of, uh, of firm decision um, by looking at basically the, the exchange rate. So we know that basically from any small open economy and actually any, any uh, economy, uh, open economy, the exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar is an important price. Actually it governs basically pricing decisions, uh, expectation about future revenue, and also like basically debt valuation. This of course is a very important object that has been studied like uh, in, many, in many studies. But in the same way that when we think about inflation expectation, there are some challenges when we try to measure the effect of changes in the exchange rate or changes in the expectation of exchange rate uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, like the effect of that uh, in economic decision. So first, uh, the, the, I mean, the path of, of nominal exchange rate is usually uh, correlated with other fundamentals. Secondly, there is not a lot of data available on expected exchange rate for price setters. And finally, like it's very difficult to separate the direct effect of um, of uh, of, uh, of uh, changes in exchange rate with other uh, general equilibrium effects. So basically, when there are changes in exchange rate, monetary policy changes, uh, fiscal policy might react at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really hard to measure. I'm going to discuss in a second, uh, uh, basically, other approach and how we, we use this. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we do in this paper, so first, but what we do is that we, try to, we will try to estimate the elasticity of firm outcome to an exogenous change in the future ex, uh, expected exchange rate. So how we're gonna do that, we're first gonna measure the, the nominal exchange rate perception and expectations for a pattern of firms in a small open economy. Secondly, using an RCT with the information treatment, we're gonna uh, basically like induce variation in the expected exchange rate. We're gonna measure the effect this, on, on, on this effect on firm's expectation and the persistence of this effect and finally, we're going to link this survey with administrative data that is outside of basically our survey, and through that, basically try to estimate the elasticity of a change in the exchange rate on a, on the on the on firm decision. In particular, in particular, we're going to focus on import and export. This result, in a way, is going to be a combination. It's going to be a partial equilibrium in the sense that firms, at the, only the firms are going to be are going to be affected, but basically we allow them to actually have a more general equilibrium. And again, this has a very similar parallel of the discussion that we had this morning and yesterday about the effect of, of, uh, of inflation expectation, mental models, et cetera. Um, so of course, like kind of, uh, again, I, I wanna come back a little bit of the effect of, of, of depreciation of, of, of like or, or expected depreciations. So of course, this is a huge topic in, 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 in international economics. And there are usually like two type of strategies like to measure the effect of a depreciation of expected depreciation on economic outcome. So on one side, there's uh, this paper that focuses on large depreciation, many times focus, for example, on the big depreciation that Mexico had in 84. So basically what they do there, you look at huge depreciation in a country, you look at how certain firms that are more exposed and less exposed react to these changes, and then you try to infer basically what's the effect of the depreciation on economic decisions. 
The second one, actually, we have a paper with Bernardo Candia there, um, is we're basically looking at uh, changes in regime. So for example, when the US left the gold standard, basically that was a huge change in the monetary policy uh, framework, huge depreciation because of that, then let's see a firm that are more or less exposed. Uh, Buscas have a similar paper, and Foucault and co-authors basically they look at basically changes in regime uh, more generally for a pattern of country. The problem with this uh, approach is that this differs separate the, basically the direct effect with the G effect. Let's talk about the gold standard in our paper with uh, Bernardo, for example. So you have the US leave the gold standard, you have basically fiscal policy, a new president, uh, the New Deal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's hard to disentangle basically what, what's driven the, the main effect. So basically what we're gonna do in this paper is not like basically say that they are wrong, but actually what we're gonna do is that instead of exploring the depreciation by itself, we can explore deviation from full information. So what we're gonna see is the first, we're gonna measure the exchange rate of the firms. We're gonna be basically how, uh, how this agreement they have uh, for, 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 this, for this particular variable. And then we're gonna treat particular firms that they're gonna change, we're gonna change how they think about the exchange rate, uh, keeping all the rest of the economy in a well constant. So prices are not gonna change, policy are not gonna change. So this is just changing basically how they change and then like learning about uh, their decision. And this again like, can teach us basically what ingredients maybe they are missing in the, in the models that we basically described below to try to understand the effect of depreciations in, in economic decision. Um, this paper we're gonna do it in Colombia. So just to give you a, a sense, this is an emerging economy with a floating exchange rate. And something that is important for this context is that there are other work that have showed that actually 98% of the imports are invoiced in US dollar. It means that actually when we are measuring like, the exchange rate with the US dollar, that's gonna be the most relevant price for firms in this country. And also like basically for you, for, for you that you, uh, for, 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 for the group of you that come from development economies, you probably know that actually the exchange rate of a salient price, a reference price. Uh, so actually like uh, uh, there is a lot of knowledge about it. So let me move a little bit to the survey and basically the exercise that we do. So something that is nice about it, and this is related with the discussion that we had before, uh, or that they had in the panel, is basically it's very hard to get actual information from firms manager uh, uh, because usually that it's, it's, it's hard to reach them and basically we have a hard time uh, make them, uh, make them uh, making them answer. So basically what we do here is we're gonna partner with another company. So basically this is a survey that is developed by a company called Fe Desarrollo. That basically what they do is that they had been building this relationship with firms to build this uh, index of, of economic confidence. They call these, these, these managers and usually they have a, fe, a very high basically like response rate. So what we do is kind of we like intervene these, 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 uh, these, these uh, measures. So first, we change the, the, the question of inflation expectation. They used to have a, a question that was increased, decrease or stay the same. And we basically like kind of like uh, add a, an, open, an open question. And then we add other question about inflation perception, exchange rate perception, and exchange rate uh, depreciation. This basically is, uh, this is a panel, uh, this, this is a panel uh, of firms, is representative of the manufacturing and retail sector, and we have roughly 500 uh, firms a month. So basically these are the two questions, first the pre-treatment question that we're gonna ask, and second the second treatment that we're gonna ask. Of course in this type of experiment, ideally we want to ask the same type of question two times, to give the information treatment, that's of course is really hard, they tend to be like kind of like consistent with their answer, they think that we have tricked them, so instead of that, we're gonna ask him some questions that are proxy of, uh, of, of the prior, and basically we're gonna show how correlated they are uh, 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 to see if, how, how good of a prior is. Uh, we're gonna have questions about the inflation expectation as a benchmark, and then we're gonna focus more on the change rate. So the pre question first is that if you were to buy US, uh, US dollar this week, what is the price that you think that you would be able to get uh, in, the, in the financial market? And for CPI is what you think the perception, uh, what, 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 is the, what, what you think is gonna be the CPI at the end of this month. Then we, we're gonna give a subgroup some information treatment, and then, uh, and then the post-treatment is like for the firms, uh, 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 for the exchange rate, it's gonna be if you were to buy dollars in the financial sector in 12 months, what do you think is gonna be the, the exchange rate that you can buy? And the same thing, the typical question for inflation expectation, these are open answers, they can just have to put a number there, uh, and it's pretty open. Um, this is how the time series looks. So first, again, as a benchmark, this is how inflation expectation look. So you can see like this is very similar to what happened for the US and other, and other countries. So a little bit of upward bias, some disagreement. And, and again, like we started with the uh, inflation expectation 2019. And you can see that actually like this is the same thing that happened for the US when you compare it with SOFI, for example. They tend to increase like a little bit uh, slower than actually inflation. Uh, when we look at the exchange rate, actually we see like way less disagreement. 
In particular, the now cast, uh, basically the, the perception is very, there is very little disagreement, but for the forecast, there is some disagreement. And it tracks very closely the actual value of the, of the exchange rate. Just to give you a benchmark, this, basically this is how uh, firms uh, forecast and professional forecaster. So this is what happened with inflation. And we compare it with professional forecaster, we find exactly the same thing that, for example, Linkpage uh, wrote and, and uh, Wolfhard find for, for German data, very similar to what happened for the US and New Zealand. So that basically like firms tend to have an upward bias and they are like kind of seven to eight times more dispersed that actually like uh, firms have. This is this actually the same than Germany, a little bit more than in the case of the US, which, what you uh, showed before for Sophie. In the, case, in, in the case of the forecast, also we find this, this, this upward bias, but actually like li a little bit of less disagreement. So actually this is just two to three times more, 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 more dispersed than actually professional forecast. So in terms of the research design, again, we're gonna randomly provide some information treatment to a treat and control group. We're gonna stratify this randomization for prior prioritized firms. So these are the firms that the, this company is really trying to sample every week. Uh, by industry and retail, and by exporter and not exporters. So basically, we are uh, 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 we, we are random, randomizing all these conditions, and, and again, like the, the 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 rest is basically pretty similar to what I showed you before. In terms of the information treatment, again, that just as a subsample of firms, what we're going to do is that we're going to give them some information treatment about the exchange rate. This basically comes from uh, uh, the appendix of the Fair, of the Bank of uh, Banco de la Republica, the Central Bank of Colombia, that basically they developed this survey of professional forecaster, and basically in their reports, in some appendix, they publish this number. So basically what we're going to tell them, we are not going to show you in the table, we just tell them, according to the last survey of uh, analyst expectation conducted by the Central Bank, the exchange rate in July 2020 is expected to be 3,750 pesos. Yeah? So basically that's information treatment that we're going to uh, give to uh, half of the, of the respondents. So now let's focus first on what is the effect of uh, this treatment on the reaction. So basically we run the typical regression uh, where we have like, uh, ju just, just to give a sense, so basically firms here, I mean, most of the firm are kind of like are in a consistent panel, but sometimes some firms don't answer. So basically what we do there is that basically uh, we re-randomize the firm that, that basically that enter, right? So that's why we have a time fix effect here just to account for those few firms that actually add. But in general, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna basically regress the expected depreciation on basically the prior or basically actually the now cost of the, of, the, of the depreciation. And we're gonna interact this with a time, with a time dummy. Again, pretty similar that we have seen uh, the days before. And this is just to show you how it looks. So basically this, the blue line, is how the now cost and the forecast of exchange rate correlate, basically very strong correlated, correlation almost close to one, as I'm gonna show you in a second. And for the, uh, for the treated group, actually like this correlation breaks a little bit. This means that actually firms are using the information that we're giving them, they're putting less weight on this proxy of, of a prior, and they're putting like some weight on the, on the information that we're giving them. Again, this is just visual. Uh, basically, like, again, the correlation is very strong. And actually, basically, after getting the treatment, firms uh, put like kind of something like two-thirds less of a weight on their, on their, on their, on their now cast as uh, compared to the, to the control group. And if you worry about outliers, we run this with OLS, Uber regression, we get like actually pretty, pretty, uh, pretty similar re um, results. In general, they give like some very reasonable numbers, so we are not worried about like big changes in, the, in their forecast. Also, we can split this by different type of companies. So for example, we have for all the sample, this is exactly basically this 0.9 minus 65. So, oh, sorry. This is the number that we have here. But we can split from retail manufacturing, exporter, and non-exporter. And what we find here actually like for exporter firm, this treatment ha doesn't have a lot of effect. This is very consistent with actually a uh, Michael Vienna Willow uh, paper where like they, 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 they write this model of uh, rational attention in the context of an RCT that firms that actually have a lot, uh, 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 basically uh, a high incentive to gather information about certain variables because for example, their loss function depend a lot of it. Uh, they should not update that much with this information treatment because they are already pretty informed or they have a very sophisticated uh, model uh, when, they estimate, uh, when they estimate inflation. This is exactly what we find. So mostly exporters, uh, basically, uh, when they're pricing in US dollar in this case, actually they have a lot of incentive to, to, to pay attention to this measure. Non-exporters have less of that, of that effect. Now we can also estimate the dynamic effect. So let's say, what, as it's a panel dimension, let's see what happened like uh, uh, periods after this, this intervention. So basically this is the, the exact coefficient. This is for the control group. And this is what happened if we 
go, then the, this is basically first the same amount of the survey. This is basically the 0 0.95 that we, I showed you before. And this is basically what happened one month, two months, three months before. So basically this is saying that after two months, they are the correlation between the outcasts that they had before and the forecast that we have after basically is 0 0.2, right? And then basically it's undistinguished from zero. So now let's see what happened with the treatment group. We found that the treatment group, again, this is the 0 0.3 that I showed you before, the 0 0.9 minus 0 0.6. So basically this is the number that we have here. And then we see that basically the correlation between the outcasts that they had before, again, like kind of like at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the, this is in, in August 2021, with the one that basically we started measuring like months after goes to zero and actually stays to zero. This means that we, got, we can say that the firms remember the, the treatment at least, or like they're influenced by the, by the treatment at least two months after the, the, the coefficient. We cannot say anything after this, not because basically, not, not because they forgot about the treatment or they're not using this treatment anymore, just because we cannot measure, we cannot basically have any significant effect with the, with the, with the treatment group. We can, also, uh, we can also see what happened with the outcast and forecast of inflation and, now, and, and outcast of inflation, and we find very similar effect. Something that is interesting that actually like the outcast about exchange rate is still influenced up to three months after, after the intervention. So that means that there is basically, they keep remember this, uh, this information treatment for a long time, and that might affect their decision in a, in a, in a, in a significant way. So now like, let's see the, the effect of, uh, of, of the treatment effect on firm decisions. And again, like kind of like in, in this case, basically what we try to aim is kind of to see which variables uh, are affected by firm decision. This again, like also goes to the discussion that we had before in a sense that uh, it's important to measure which importation matter, but also like what type of decision are affected by these expectations. And what we're gonna do here uh, is uh, to link our survey with administrative data on expert and import. So basically we have our survey, we have an identifier of the firm Externally, through the government, basically they, pub they, they publish data of import and export firms using, and they publish this ID number so we can match the survey with this ID and know exactly basically how they act outside of the survey. This is not something that we ask them. It's not something that they expect. It's what they actually did uh, in the survey. So basically, um, we, 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 uh, we link uh, this survey and then we can run a regression that is very similar uh, uh, to what, um, to what we, 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 uh, we, we saw to, uh, before, that basically we have the log of the import on the, on the, on the basically the log of the import. This is a year from, uh, from the survey. So we, t we take a year since they were surveyed for a year after, and then we com basically co we control with what happened the year before. And then we have the log of the, of the, of the exchange rate. And we instrument this log of the exchange rate basically with the, with the variation induced by the, by the RCT. This is basically, uh, the same thing that people in this audio have used uh, uh, before, and they, the idea is to use the, the variation that comes from there. So this is, this is basically our result. Let's focus on this, on this table here. So what we see is that the first, like kind of when we look at the log of import, we see that again, like kind of like the causal effect in this case, like uh, the effect that comes from the, from the exogenous variation, we find an, an, an elasticity of exchange rate to imports of six, uh, that's statistically significant. This test is, 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 is strong. Actually, we do a bunch of tests of weak instrument and we find that actually like uh, it's not a weak instrument. Uh, and we find this elasticity of 0.6. Now, basically, then what we do is that we split the sample between importers that are exporters and importers that are non-exporters. And what we find that the effect on importers that are not exporters is actually stronger, the elasticity of nine. And what we see basically what happened with the effect of importer and no exporter, we don't find a statistically significant effect, but this is coming from a very weak instrument. And if you remember from the result that I showed you before, this treatment was not effective on basically, sh on, 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 was not effective on moving basically like a expectation of exchange rate for exporters. And this is exactly what we find how here, it's not that the exchange rate doesn't affect their decision, it's just that we have a weak instrument so we cannot measure it. And this is exactly what happened when we look at exports uh, by firms, again, like here we find a coefficient that is relatively, uh, re relatively uh, strong, but, uh, but, uh, but actually the instrument is, uh, sorry, we find a point estimate that is, that is relatively big, but the instrument is very weak, so actually standard are huge, we cannot say anything about, about, about their decisions. Just a little bit uh, uh, to understand what's the importance of this elasticity, again, like kind of uh, what we find is elasticity uh, close to six, uh, and basically like the intuition of this is that what happens is that firms tend to, uh, when they see like basically a higher price, uh, a higher price, uh, they tend to, uh, because of the depreciation, they tend to anticipate imports and they import more. 
This mechanism is usually absent for usual, from, from a normal uh, or like a, a usually used a model of international economics because most of them have basically like a, a non-durable imports. So basically there is no role for expectation in that sense. But basically Alessandra Kavosky and Midrigan, and actually since then others, they focus a little bit more on this idea that actually imports also in our data is very, uh, inf uh, is, is done infrequently, so basically it's storable, and then like, there is a margin for this kind of like strategic behavior that when I see a higher, uh, a higher uh, um, uh, import price, uh, then like kind of I would anticipate. Actually, like there are some work that actually have tried to test this kind of like uh, this idea, but it's usually in the context of tariffs. So for example, there is in the case of NAFTA, when NAFTA was announced, basically firms tended to uh, reduce their imports uh, waiting for what happened. Of course, like tariff, they are not, they, they are not, they are not policy instrument. Actually, like maybe in the future they're gonna be used in the US, but uh, exchange rate is a variable that is also, uh, uh, constantly changing. So basically firm are basically forming expectation constantly about them, and this could be a margin that it could be interesting again, like to understand this, uh, this dynamics of, of trade and how basically export and imports behave when there are like these big or expected big depreciations. So, just to conclude, basically we find that firms first, they react to public information, affecting their exchange rate uh, expectations, and also basically we find that actually firms act upon this information, are actually like uh, we're able to, to, to see that firms basically change their import behavior when there are changes in the expected, uh, in, in the in the in their expected depreciation. So, uh, so actually, uh, again, like in this work, we show that actually firms uh, uh, act upon this information and they change their behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, uh, so before I, uh, I open the floor, allow me maybe to ask you a question. Um, so uh, my question is a bit motivated by the work of Mary Amiti and, and co-authors on, on uh, exchange rate pass-through. So um, what, what they found, uh, I, I, I understand using, uh, that, let's say, data from, from Belgium, also a small open economy, is that uh, there is this, uh, let's say, correlation where big importers are also big exporters and, and vice versa. So I was wondering to what extent, let's say, um, does, let's say, Colombia differ uh, uh, in, in, in that dimension, and, and does that play a role, let's say, maybe to, uh, to explain some, let's say, heterogeneity in your, in your uh, results? Um, so, do we have any questions in the audience? Um, please, floor is open. Yeah, over there. Uh, uh, do you find any heterogeneity by firm characteristics? Like, uh, for example, bigger firm could have uh, stronger forecasting groups, could have better information about exchange rate. So even there could be some variation even within importers. <laughs> Maybe I can answer these two questions first. Or? Yep. Um, so yeah, so about uh, the correlation with big imports and exports, I think that basically the main, uh, the main like heterogeneous effect that we find, I think I speak a little bit to both of your questions, is basically the separation between sectors, right? So we have manufacturing and retail sector. Uh, and then uh, in the case of the retail sector, we have importers, but they usually they are importers or they can be importers, but they are not exporters. Uh, in the case of the manufacturing sector, we have, we have, we have actually both. Uh, and what we find, uh, I mean, in terms of the, of the treatment effect is exactly that. So if firms tend to be uh, exporters, uh, basically the treatment effect doesn't, I mean, the treatment doesn't have an effect on their, on their forecast. Therefore, we don't have any power to actually like measure the, this effect. And I think like that speaks a little bit uh, to your point of the big importer exporters. Uh, that's exactly the result that I, that, I, that I showed at the end, basically when there is like an importer that is also, that is also an exporter, we, we cannot find an effect. Now, in terms of the size of the firm, this is something like relatively new that we add in the paper. So I, I, I had a slide for it, but I, had in the, but I have in the appendix. So our firms tend to be slightly bigger than the average of the firms, but we still have basically like firms in the whole distribution of, uh, of, of importer exporter. Uh, so now that we have basically this data, we can compare it with the, as again, we have the, 
uh, in a way, the sense of, 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 of imported exporters. We can compare the exporting size of those firms with others. Uh, so maybe we can, we can try to, to, to disentangle a, 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 bit, a little bit this, uh, this ed potential heterogeneity on side of imported exporter. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't have basically size in terms of sales for all firms or like assets, stuff like that. But this is something that we can definitely do. And the same thing um, uh, for what you were saying, like I guess like uh, maybe through this export import, we can infer a little bit what happened with their size. Uh, and then through that, uh, 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 get a sense if they're a stronger effect or not for, for firms that are bigger uh, compared to others. But yeah, that, that's something that we can definitely do. Um, I, I, I mean, we don't. Okay. Uh, I don't know if maybe through, uh, I mean, our partner, we can get more information about them. Uh, I, that is tricky because there is something with uh, uh, the anony anonymity of the of the survey, but that's something that would be interesting to to look at. Yes, the only thing that we know, like kind of like for sure, is that again, like as this company have basically been building this relationship with these companies, and actually like. From this survey, they publish uh, this kind of like measure of um, cons like firm sentiment in, the, in in Colombia, and it's kind of publicized. Uh, I mean, it's a relationship where actually like they're pretty. I mean, they they, they they told us that they're getting to actually the actual manager, actually decision makers of the firms. Uh, so that's something that um, again, like uh, we know from them, but we don't know exactly their, their their name or actually their their characteristic. We can try to ask more, but I don't. I mean, we, we don't have it from the data that we got. Yep. Mm -hmm. ah, there is Philip from University of Bonn. So I found it very interesting that, as you say, that they, they update in response to public information, and then they also change their behavior. But that means that, I mean, must not have been public for them, right? So do you have an idea where they're not aware where to get that information, or did they not know what to make of that information? I mean, it seems that they know, they direct somehow, they, they seem to know what, how to use the information. So do you have an, maybe even anecdotal evidence why it is that they reacted so strongly? I mean, what I can tell you, like, it's public, but it's not super easily accessible. As I told you, like, as I showed you in the table, basically, in the appendix of the monetary policy report, there is a huge kind of table with, like, a different month, different month horizon, uh, again, like, I'm not super, I, I, I'm not sure basically if actually like uh, firms like track this data every month. Um, uh, but in that sense, for example, we don't find again like any, any effect on exporter. We don't know exactly it's because they know this information already or maybe they have a more sophisticated forecasting model. So basically they think that this information is not useful. Uh, I mean, but the only thing that I can tell you like from trying to get to that data, again, it's public, but it's not that basically it's just everywhere and, 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 and free to use. My guess would be that most of those companies or most of those minor managers, they either don't know about the survey or they don't know that this survey has basically that granular information. Uh, so they probably like just don't, don't, don't use it. Uh, they act up on them, but again, like we, we, we never know basically uh, how the benefit compared to the cost of actually like of learning about this, this, this survey and keeping track of it like every, every month or something like that. Oh, yeah. Fantastic paper. Um, uh, you showed this very interesting results that um, the uh, um, exporting importing firms have basically no effect. They, and you interpreted this that they know what the forecast is. An alternative story could be also that they are insured against uh, exchange rate uh, volatility. They make their contracts in advance, so uh, they basically don't care hmm. uh, what the exchange rate will be. Yeah. So actually, that, that's a pretty good point. Um, actually, there is there is there, there is not that much data about the about the first, but there is a word for Chile where they use also the census data basically on on on, on basically financial derivative to to hedge against the exchange rate. And what that paper concludes is first, like only very big firms actually use them, and secondly, even for firms that use it, it's really hard to match actually the different maturities of export and import and and have enough financial instrument to actually be completely hedged under like for, uh, for for this kind of exchange rate risk. So what we take from that paper is that maybe for the biggest firm that might be the exporter of our sample, this can be true, or the exporter importers of our sample that might be true. But even for those, it's really hard to get like a 
financial instrument that is sophisticated enough to actually like uh, hedge them against like the like, the different material from export and import and different contracts that they have. But yeah, that that's definitely a, a, a very a very important point as well. Yeah. So I was actually want to ask the same question, but I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, uh, by the way, my name is Chen Wang from University of Notre Dame. Um, so does the readout speak also to some of the maybe usual puzzles we have in the exchange rate? Uh, for for example, the CIP violation or the UIP. Uh, if you if you basically plug in people's expectations, especially those people uh, who have uh, received the shot the, the treatment from from your experiment, do they behave in a way that's more aligned with the textbook? Uh, CIP, viol uh, CIP, or do they deviate even more from um, those uh, essential identities? Yeah, I mean, like from the periods of this paper, we don't have information about their financial decisions. So that that could be something that uh, might be useful in that in in that case. We also don't have financial firms, so we cannot uh, track them. So that the only the only decision that we have in the is in their import and import, export. But actually, this UIP deviation or or like. A, or the deviation like can, can be explained with some behavioral models. So for example, uh, with Rafael in the audience, we, we, we have recently like a, a paper where we look at how people form expectation with their friends and actually we find that actually like can break, uh, for example, the risk sharing condition uh, in, 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 in some models. So that's something that definitely like kind of this kind of behavioral bias can, can explain. In this paper, we don't have enough information to actually like kind of like characterize uh, what is the, the, the behavioral uh, uh, or basically how they form expectations. But uh, that's something that definitely can explain that. Unfortunately, we don't also don't have the data to, to show it. But yeah, that's a very good point. Thanks. Thank you, Mathieu. Thanks. Um, the next paper, we move to Pamela. Thank you. OK. So first of all, thank you so much to the organizer for the great conference and also for including our paper. This is joint work with Stefano Rossi at Bucconi Finance. So OK. So coherence is typically considered to be uh, the consistency of the elements of a person's judgment and one of the two standards of rationality of judgments together with accuracy. Um, in the context of multidimensional forecasting, which is of interest in our project, uh, coherence requires that forecast of individual variables incorporate the connections among the variables being forecasted, whereas accuracy requires that forecast of individual variables not be systematically different from realizations exposed. Uh, there is a large literature on forecast accuracy, but not so much about forecast coherence. And so in this paper, we study forecast coherence within a specific context, which is the context of firms' uh, internal planning. What do I mean by that? I'm referring to the fact that as part of their jobs, uh, CFOs routinely um, uh, make internal forecasts over balance sheet variables in order to uh, allocate resources within the firm. How do they do that? Well, they fill in pro forma statements. So think about these as little tables. The CFO starts from the top row by issuing a forecast about sales revenues and which act, acts as a target and then proceed by forecasting other items such as uh, capital expenditures, labor expenditures and so on to achieve that target. Um, this is a high stake and challenging multidimensional forecasting problem um, where uh, allegedly CFOs should take into account uh, the relationship among, among the variables being forecasted and in particular, uh, you know, the production possibility of the firm which we think acts as a natural uh, benchmark of coherence in our context. And in particular here, we are gonna be interested in the basic question of whether uh, forecasting coherence, perhaps through failing to take into account the relationships among the variables being forecasted, may be costly to the firm because it might induce a suboptimal allocation of resources to inputs. There is another piece of background that I need to share with you in order for you to understand what you're trying to do in this paper, which is that, um, the managerial education literature has recognized the importance and difficulty of uh, making internal plans. And so to help CFOs uh, has provided the simple recipes, basically regression-based rules, which we're gonna refer to as heuristics or rules of thumb. And uh, these 
uh, are interesting because th there is a number of them out there. They imply very different forecasts, and they also suggest a different concern for coherence, ranging from no concern at all to serious concern about coherence. And to the best of our knowledge, uh, these rules have not been uh, evaluated so far, either theoretically or empirically. So a main contribution of the paper, at least as we see it, is to actually use uh, theory and data to evaluate them. So to be more precise, uh, we see our paper as providing theory and evidence on, first of all, the prevalence with an extent to which CFOs of uh, mid and large US, uh, firms uh, make coherent or incoherent forecasts about own output and input variables. Um, the, uh, we established the empirical relevance of forecasting coherence by showing that it's negatively associated with the firm performance. Um, and we propose a specific mechanism under, about why this might happen, which is the use of suboptimal forecasting heuristics by CFOs, a fraction of CFOs, obviously. Uh, so by doing this, we provide an evaluation of these rules of thumb. In addition, uh, in the last part of the paper and also the presentation, if I make it, we propose a number of theory-based restrictions and derive formal statistical tests to uh, try to assess coherence empirically based on, on, on data, on forecasts sometimes and sometimes on forecast errors. And also, in a couple of cases, we are going to be able to use those tests to kind of separate empirically uh, incoherence from inaccuracy, essentially, or coherence from accuracy. Um, and of course, we're going to do that by building on several strands of literature and also contributing to them, including important work by people in these rooms and quarters of theirs. Of course, in the interest of time, because I have a lot of things I would like to tell you, I'm going to skip the details and uh, dive in into the uh, rules of thumb that we're going to consider and embed in our theoretical framework in order to evaluate them. So we consider five heuristics that we take from uh, a book by Ivo Welch, uh, and I'm going to describe them to you right now, OK? So rule one says, if you want to forecast an item, say capital expenditures growth, you can do that by projecting past values of that items into the future, essentially without concerning yourself about the relationship of that item with other items. Rule two says, well, you know, you care about a certain target for sales revenues, so why not um, basically anchoring uh, the forecast of the other items to the sales forecast by uh, forecasting each item as a fixed proportion of, of the sales revenues forecast. Um, rule number three, it's a version, if you like, it's a bit more sophisticated version of rule two, where you use external data, typically composite data, to first estimate the relationship between the item you want to forecast and sales revenues using essentially univariate regression. Once you get your estimated intercept and your estimated slope, you multiply the estimated slope by the um, sales revenue forecast, you add in the intercept, and that's going to be your uh, forecast for, uh, say, capital expenditures growth. Uh, rule four is a version of rule three where you acknowledge that perhaps these relationships vary by industry, and so maybe instead of using the whole population of composite firms, you are only going to use the ones uh, for the relevant industry of your firm. Finally, rule five, which we call sophisticated, is the only one that uh, uses multivariate regressions and therefore conditions in the regression also on other items beyond uh, sales revenues. Okay. So hopefully this is clear. So now we're gonna I'm going to give you the elements of the theoretical framework uh, where we nest these rules of thumb. Uh, of course, I'm going to go by highlights because uh, you know, I have limited time. So we consider profit maximizing firms uh, with a CS production function and a cost function. Hopefully the notation is straightforward. Um, uh, I'm going to carry out through the slides the case with two inputs, but in the paper we show that everything uh, goes through with any inputs. And we make a number of assumptions. I want to highlight two in particular, especially the one that I call A1, because it's very important and biting. It has advantages as well as disadvantages, and I want to be clear about those. So we are going to assume, at least in this paper, that there are no technological 
There is no technological innovation or disruption, and there are no aggregate shocks. So we are in a setting of stability. Of course, this has the disadvantage that in this paper, we are not going to be able to tell you anything about the meaning and the implications of coherence or incoherence in a setting with dynamics. It's in the, you know, it's a, a you know, uh, we plan to work on that, but not in this paper. The uh, huge advantage of this assumption, what buys us, is that we are in a setting where ex ante and ex -co exposed coherence are conceptually the same thing. There is no wedge between them, conceptual or otherwise. And we can, therefore, nest within the same framework both the concept of coherence and the concept of accuracy, learn about their relationship and distinctions, and also learn a lot about both of them uh, with cross-sectional variations in firms' forecasts and realizations for the relevant variables. The other assumption is an assumption on the uh, uh, process for prices, we assume IID log normally distributed prices with some correlation among the inputs. We are not going to have separate data on Qs and Ps. We are only going to have forecasts about the financial variables, so the product of the two. Okay? Very good. So at a given time P, the forecaster is going to issue a vector of forecasts, one per each element, by minimizing expected inaccuracy, which is going to take the form of an expected square loss under a coherence constraint which is embedded in the CFO information set, meaning that the, the potentially at least the CFO is going to take into account the relationship among the variables through the production function. Uh, and so why do we make this assumption? Well, we use square loss because it's a natural way to incorporate the rules of thumb, right? All of them are conditional means essentially. And also we assume that CFOs know their production functions. We may not as econometricians, but they do. Um, we have a normative version of the model where we establish that ex ante optimal coherent forecast should satisfy a simple inequality condition that basically is an application of Jensen inequality that says that, you know, um, uh, whose direction is going to depend on whether the CES is concave or convex. And then we focus on the Cobb-Douglas case because I'm sure you have noticed that the rules of thumb are linear and the Cobb-Douglas is linear in log. So if we want to give a shot to those rules of thumb to, to be optimal or at least a first in, in a first order approximation sense, we consider that case and we establish that the inequality holds with equality in levels and growth rates. Now, Clearly, these uh, uh, restrictions or these uh, inequalities and inequalities could be used already as a basis for a test of forecast coherence or incoherence ex ante. We have an illustration in the paper. We don't push it too much because in our setting we have data on forecasts, so this would be an ex ante test, but we don't have good data to estimate the parameters of the production function at the credible level of disaggregation. So we provide an illustration, but we don't push it too much. We want to go to forecast errors where we think we can be more credible. Okay, so we also consider the case where uh, the forecaster doesn't know the parameters of the production function but can estimate them via linear projections. Long story short, we established that a version of the multivariate rule is optimal uh, and the univariate rules, we derive conditions under which they can be optimal too, but it's all. I mean, they are optimal only under very special and unlikely uh, cases. Uh, then we move to a positive version of the model where we allow for the possibility that CFOs may be incoherent because as a, as a kind of uh, optimal response to imperfect information. For example, some CFOs may be better informed about some inputs and less about others, and that might generate uh, incoherence. And so how do we go about this? Well, we borrow, <laughs> thankfully, uh, um, uh, Chen Lian's model of narrow thinking in consumption, and we adapt it to the case of production and forecasting in production. And um, basically, we recast the forecasting problem as multiple selves playing an, an incomplete information common interest game. So the way you should think about it is that the CFO has multiple selves. Each self is in charge of one, of forecasting one item. And he does or she does so with imperfect information about the other 
cells uh, uh, forecast that is uh, uh, signals or state of minds. And so narrow thinking, so the narrow bracketing kind of rules, uh, occurs because they reflect this interpersonal friction in coordinating forecast across va different variables. Uh, the main result here, which is written in terms of input one, but of course I can rewrite it in terms of any input, is that if you want to, you know, that the optimal forecast of, uh, say, for example, inputs one, uh, given the signals, is as a very natural uh, form. It's, it's a linear projection whose intercept is basically the prior mean for the input you want to forecast, plus two terms which are respectively the deviations of the signal from the prior mean of the output and second input respectively, multiplied by coefficients that are functions of the you know, technology parameters and uh, parameters that capture the uncertainty, you know, the price processes and so on. Okay, we also, uh, and so the bottom line is even in a second best world under imperfect information, we rationalize R5 as the best, and then we derive conditions under which we can rationalize the other rules, but essentially to rationalize R1, we need infinitely noisy signals both on output and input. To rationalize the univariate rules, we need infinitely noisy signals on uh, the second input and noisy but informative signals on the output. We can never really rationalize R2. Okay. So bottom line, our framework uh, produces a partial ordering on the rules of thumb. R5 is best, R1, R2 worse, the other two are kind of intermediate, and predicts that insofar as incoherence in internal planning induces suboptimal allocation of resources to input, we predict that the profits will decrease as the deviation of the actual forecast from the exam the optimal one increases, and the mechanisms for that is the use of rules of thumb such as R1 or R2 the suboptimal ones. Let me go to the data real quick. And so uh, we have two main sources of data. CFO expectations come from the Duke survey. Uh, here I'm only gonna tell you that for our purposes, what's key is that they elicit point forecasts of multiple firm variables jointly using a table like that, which is very much reminds the uh, proforma statement I was talking about. And the realizations come from CompuStat. We link the data at the individual firm level using firm ID. And the two main things I want to notice here is that the matches are concentrated in the early period, which for us is not a problem really, because we are anyway restricting ourselves to the pre-financial crisis period to be coherent with our assumption of stability in the theoretical framework. A bit more problematic is the fact that CompuStat has a very poor coverage of wages, which would be our favorite measure of uh, labor costs. So we have to, you know, <laughs> use other approaches that I'm going to touch on later. Okay, so now I'm going to do two things. First, to show you some descriptive evidence that we interpret through the lenses of our framework, but which doesn't really rely on any specific assumption that we made in the framework. Later, if I have time, I'm going to rely more heavily on our assumption and show you some tests that we derive based on those assumptions. Okay, so how do we proceed? Step number one, we use composite data to implement each and every uh, one of the five rules I told you about. In this case, I'm showing you the regression for CAPEX and of course for rule one, three, four, and five because rule two does not require estimation. Rule two says intercept one, uh, uh, slope one, uh, sorry, intercept zero, slope one, right? So what I would like you to take away from this slide is that no matter which rule you use between among the three, four, or five, the intercept is positive, large, and statistically significant. So if you use rule two, you are missing the intercept, and therefore you are systematically underpredicting capital, exp capital expenditure for any given target of sales revenue you would like to achieve. For a slightly different reason, that's also what happens if you ru use rule one because of the mean reversion implied by that estimation there. Now that we have uh, for each firm the, fir the forecast implied by each rule, we compare that those with the, the forecast that we see in the survey, and we assign to each CFO the rule of thumb that is closest to the one that they give in the survey. And if you look at the bottom row of this table, that gives you the empirical distribution in the sample of rule of thumb uses, use, and that tells you that 40% of CFOs in our sample use rule two, 
which is the you know, easy and popular one. You anchor your, your forecast to, to sales revenues. And 10 per, a remarkable 10% uses exactly rule two because the distance is equal to zero, okay? 8% um, uses seem to be using R1. About 15% use the sophisticated one, but the bottom line is, if you buy that rule one and R2 are not good, 48% use one of those two. Okay, so, oh, and we construct dummy variables for these uh, indicators for these rules of thumb, which are essentially gonna represent our discrete measure of coherence slash incoherence. Then we construct a more continuous measure of exact incoherence, which is equal to the orthogonal distance between uh, the, the forecast that the CFO gives and rule five, which we take as you know, the, the benchmark. And uh, of course, the theory tells us exactly how to do that. Empirically, we have to play around and do a bunch of different things because of wage, uh, the problem with wage growth. Um, so then we are gonna relate our measures of incoherence with firm outcomes, but before doing that, we show that they are related to each other, and in particular, this is a regression of exact incoherence on the dummy variables for the rules of thumb, and this says that rule one uh, CFOs are those with the largest incoherence, followed by the rule two CFOs, and those are statistically significant, uh, followed by the other rule three and rule four guys, but those are not statistically significantly different in terms of exact incoherence from the rule five. Then we relate out firm outcomes to uh, our measures of incoherence. We, uh, I'm gonna focus on uh, firm performance today because I'm out of time. And so I'm gonna show you that uh, there is a negative uh, robust association between uh, exact incoherence and firm performance, both when we use the continuous measure and also when we use the rules of thumb indicator, especially for rule one and rule two. I'm not using stars, but uh, they are significant, the, at least the rule one, rule two, and the continuous measure. Of course, this evidence should be taken as descriptive. We are not claiming that there is a causal effect of uh, incoherence on firm performance. However, to make a step towards causality, we run an event study analysis where we look at what happens to firm performance when the CFO changes and therefore incoherence changes, and we confirm the negative association between the two. Okay, let me spend maybe a minute if I'm allowed on the, on the tests. Okay, so now we are gonna rely more heavily on our theoretical framework uh, to derive uh, restrictions and tests of, of, of uh, accuracy and incoherence. And I'm gonna try to convince you that forecast errors are very useful to think about coherence and incoherence, not just about accuracy or inaccuracy. Why is that? Because if you write down a general formulation of a production function, both in realizations and in expectations, if you take the difference between the two at the individual level, you are gonna get rid of a lot of unobserved heterogeneity to the econometrician, but you know, as long as the CFO knows about that heterogeneity or can predict it, that's gonna, be, that's gonna go away in, in, in forecast error. So if you are concerned with the fact that different firms may have different horizons, they may have you know, different circumstances and so on, as long as that's constant over the forecasting horizons, it's gonna go away in forecast errors. And so the basis of a lot of our tests is gonna be this uh, simpler relationship at the bottom of these slides, which relates forecast errors of output and inputs through the loadings of the individual inputs. So we do two things. One is we consider some theory-based restrictions, free disposal from free disposal and increasing returns, which tells us that in the space of forecast errors of output and some any input, in this case we do capital expenditure, uh, you know, we expect uh, the two sets of forecast error to be non-negatively associated and also to lie above, you know, below the 45 degree line and above the horizontal line. When we put the data on top, what we see is that indeed the relationship between those two variables is where we expect it to be, but 52% of the observations violate either one or both those restrictions against suggesting incoherence. Finally, we propose the regression tests. So what we do in this slide is very simple. Column one and column two 
use uh, regress forecast errors for separate uh, capex growth and uh, uh, sales revenues growth on a constant to test for accuracy and just uh, replicate results already known in the literature, which is that CFOs are pretty good at forecasting sales revenues. They are on average accurate. They are inaccurate on average at forecasting uh, capital expenditures growth, even though they have more control over that than over sales uh, revenues. And we reject on average um, uh, coherence uh, of the, the two forecasts for any uh, value of the uh, uh, capital share above 0, 03. Finally, we derive statistics at the individual level. These are the ones that are most reliant on the assumption of the theoretical framework because we basically use all the assumptions like uh, functional form assumptions, distributional assumptions, and so on. But we are able to derive uh, statistics at the individual level. We focus on the forecast error ones because they are a bit more uh, implementable with our data. That says that intuitively, um, you know, coherent forecasts of output and inputs uh, so, are gonna be, so forecasts are going to be coherent if forecast errors of output and input are sufficiently close to one another in the sense given by that metric of the C2 stat over there. And whereas uh, uh, forecasts are going to be accurate when forecast errors of individual items are small. And all possibilities are there. So we show that in this framework, uh, it's possible to have coherent and accurate, coherent and inaccurate, and, and so on and so forth. And when we test that, we find that basically about 56, 57 percent of our CFOs are incoherent, but you know, we have a mass set in all four possibilities. So to conclude, uh, while relying on assumptions of varying number and strengths, all empirical results point to about 50% of CFOs providing incoherent forecasts of simultaneous variables of the firm. Um, you know, there is a large literature in psychology talking about heuristics and some uh, camp saying they are good, some others saying they are bad. We think it really depends. Some rules are really bad, some others are not that bad. It really depends on the goal with which you're using them, and you need both theory and data to evaluate them. Thank you so much, and sorry for going over time. But I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Pamela. It was a, an achievement to present all these results. <laughs> I think we have, uh, we have time for uh, about two questions. Uh, uh, so one question over yeah. there. Um, Giorgio Toppa, New York Fed. Um, thank you, Pamela, very interesting. Um, I actually had two two thoughts. One um, on uh, you know from these open-ended interviews that we've done uh, with CFOs, CEOs, and so on, it sounds like they use kind of an um, iterative process to do their their forecasts. So they have some top-line uh, forecasts for let's say sales, and then they talk to their you know, various line managers and, you know, very uh, sort of from the bottom up, very granular, and then they sort of iterate back and forth to make them consistent. So I was wondering, you know, if you have any information on that or, or and, and where would that fit with your rules of thumb? Um, and secondly, how, to sh how should I think about multi-product firms? You know, are they completely independent, each business line, or thank you? Um, one more I question. If there's one more question, then. Yeah, so I have a like a little maybe comment or suggestion. So is it possible to maybe collaborate with, uh, uh, now is the, the basically the uh, Richmond Fed who's uh, taking over the uh, Duke CFO survey just to f maybe add uh, one module to ask them about exactly what, what kind of a process you're being, you have been through uh, when you are coming up with the two different uh, uh, forecasts. Because I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that for things they have more control, they seem to make bigger mistakes. Is there any kind of an incentive uh, problem or agency problem going on here? Or is it uh, because they are made by two maybe very separate teams and they don't, they don't really kind of uh, line up their numbers with each other? 
Thank you so much for your questions. And I actually interpret them as very related to one another, all three of them. Uh, so it's true, in the current setting, we have these multiple cells, so the friction is in, intrapersonal. But another possibility that we don't analyze in this setting because we don't have information about that is that indeed the frictions come from the fact that the, the firm is an organization with multi-products, multi, multiple managers in charge of different things and so on and so forth. So an alternative possibility, not mutually exclusive, is that indeed uh, there is an incentive to do strategic over budgeting. So each person or each manager or each is in charge of a different part and they are kind of, they have an incentive to, you know, try to <laughs> get more resources for their part. And, but of course, to study that, indeed, we do need a bit more information about the inside working of, of, of the firm. So get, thank you so much for the suggestion about collaborating with the Richmond Fed. We haven't thought about it, we, but we may try. On the other side, we started a collaboration with the Bank of Italy uh, in the context of in, in data where they collect a similar information plus additional one that uh, potentially has some promise uh, uh, to dig into this kind of issues and also to go pan, I mean, to go longitudinal with the evolution of these uh, over time and dynamics. So like, do, pe do people learn? Because we, we find this uh, negative association, but I, we feel uh, we are hesitant to draw strong conclusion about whether, so is it like there is gonna be learning over time? So these people are eventually learning to become more coherent or, uh, what else? So yes, we are definitely have plans to go in these various directions. We were thinking mainly with the Bank of Italy, but uh, thank you so much for the suggestion. Maybe we can also explore possibilities with the Richmond Fed. Yes. Thank you thank so you, much. Pamela. Yeah. So then we move to the third paper. Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much, organizers, for the possibility to present our work. So this paper um, is about uh, um, a method to measure inflation expectation, well, actually, any beliefs with involving uncertainty. And this paper wouldn't be possible without my amazing co-author, Stefan Trautmann, who is from Heidelberg University, as well associated with Tilburg University, and he is today, to, uh, he is today uh, here with us there in the audience, so he can then help me with all the questions. And Pascal Kier, and also from the Heidelberg uh, University, and I'm from uh, Deutsche Bundesbank, and therefore usual disclaimer applies. All opinions are ours, and as well as mistakes are also ours. Well, let's start me with uh, um, just motivation and a little story behind this. Well, I don't really need to sell to the audience here, obviously, that measuring inflation expectations as expectations of economic agent is very important, not only for academic purposes, but also for policy makers to assess better transmission of policy measures. It also helps us to understand economic forecast and also useful from these perspectives. Um, and there were different methods to measure uh, expectations, inflation ex expectations uh, of economic agents, particularly of households. Michigan Survey is one of the long-lasting examples. But really, the seminal innovation, one of the main innovations in, the, in this area were done uh, by Monsky in his uh, uh, Econometric Web paper in 2004, where he <coughs> argued that it can be very helpful for the purpose of measurement to give opportunity to um, individuals, or households, or firms to express uh, their beliefs, uh, their uncertain beliefs. And so he suggested a method of uh, eliciting probability distribution, which we call bin method. And this uh, method has two very important uh, strengths. First, it leaves no ambiguity about what first moment is, whether it is mean or median, it's rather clear. And second, it allows to estimate individual level uncertainty. And in this conference alone, we saw a, a lot of implication uh, for policy purposes, but as well as uh, of measuring uncertainty and using this for analysis, but also, of course, for academic studies and for understanding how people behave. So, 
for those who might have forgotten how this question looks, this is the print screen of uh, Bundesbank uh, survey uh, where um, this bid method uh, asked. Basically, it suggests that people have a uh, number of suggestive bins with uh, inflation realizations, deflation as well as inflation, and asked to uh, assign probability to scenarios. And this, uh, of course, should sum up to 100 points. Well, except of the strengths, the recent episode of high and volatile inflation, which we observed in Europe as well as in the US and other countries, highlighted the limitations of this method. First of all, it limits comparison over time and the space. So as you saw before, for example, the upper pin here, inflation 12 and higher. And of course, when inflation is very high, there is a lot of mass on this bin, and it's very difficult to compare what people actually answered in times of high inflation comparing to the times of low inflation. Also, and this is the more general um, limitation, there are evidences that the scale and the structure of the question, so this exogenous frame, uh, tends to lead people towards uh, giving certain answers, towards answering certain patterns. For example, filling in more beans, saying maybe they're uh, given, assigning probabilities to the scenarios which they would not think about on their own. Um, also, scales designed on this survey, so this scale was of course designed when inflation was relatively low and therefore the scale uh, uh, reflects um, better small values and therefore in terms of higher volatile inflation, it performs not as well. Importantly, so except those uh, frame and bin um, exogenous uh, applications, it, it poses non-trivial assumptions of no cognitive abilities of the respondents. So at least people need to be able to assess probability, so they need to be aware of the concept, know what it means. Um, and we know that it's not always the case. We also had a talk about financial literacy, and we saw how many people are not necessarily very financially knowledgeable and are just simply maybe not that well numerically. Also, there is a recent evidence, actually Michael Weber mentioned it yesterday, that bin structure, that bin width, for example, affect responses. So all in all, I just want to emphasize that from these two limitations, so from these limitations, there are three facts. First, exogenous frame may affect the answers or may lead to certain type of answers. Second, time of high and volatile inflation may differ, very, may, may be very difficult for this scale and therefore affect uh, comparison across time and space, and it poses um, cognitive demands on the respondents. So we propose a very simple, and I hope I can persuade you, interesting method, which actually avoids all this limitation to measure inflation expectations, or indeed any beliefs in which involve uncertainty. And this method rooted in decision theory, actually a work of Bailey in 2008. It is based on very simple binary comparison, which do not require assessment of probability at all. It's really more likely or less likely. Elicitation is almost entirely driven by respondents. So importantly, there is no exogenous frame which would uh, bias answers in this way. There is no magnitude de dependency, which means it's a measure applicable to any economic environment and any belief. So let's say it's an environment with low inflation and high unemployment, and you can measure both uh, beliefs about both macroeconomic variables using this method and compare them, um, and allows a comparison over time and space. So these are the strengths we would like to argue our method has. So the general idea as I said already, you split time and space using very simple binary comparison, more likely or less likely, and it will series of chain choices. So first is always media analysis, and then there is subsequent partition of 25 percentile, 75 percentile. You can go to as many details as um, the survey or the um, server uh, allows. Uh, further partitions are possible, which is, however, not always necessary or desired. And um, the method requires when uh, the method finishes when required precision is achieved or a certain number of steps is achieved. So just saying very few words about how it goes in details. So first you start by asking 
absolute bounds. So minimum, which is absolute minimum in this in a given situation, and maximum realizations, possible realizations. And uh, there, are, there is already some information in that. As we know, this is informative. Um, it also prevents researcher from giving a lower stand upper bound, and it helps participants to structure their thoughts. And then by section process start using a very simple uh, formula, the midpoint elicited, and then the respondents asked to compare the two, um, the two, uh, be well, beans, I would try to, to like to avoid this, uh, two intervals. Um, respondents indicate which is more likely, and then the process uh, again starts with eliciting new midpoint and so on and so forth. So how does it work in practice? So this is a scheme. This is not how the survey screens look, but this is pr probably instructive to understand. Let's say we have a very, very wide range from zero, which is minimum, and 20% is at the top, and uh, the probability beyond these bounds is counted as zero probability. Let's say it required precision 1.5%. You will see further what it means. First, we will find median. The midpoint is 10, very clearly. And then we ask respondent, which of the following two scenarios regarding the rate of inflation over the next 12 months do you consider to be more likely? Is it between 0 and 10 or 10 and 12? Respondent clicks on the respective answer. Let's say it's between 10 and 12. And then use an updated lower bound, which is 10. And upper bound 20, you calculate the new midpoint, which is 15. Then we have. Uh, repeated uh, screen which says, okay, now you have these two uh, intervals, 0, 15 and 15, 20. Which one do you think is more likely? Respondents clicks. Then you calculate again the new midpoint on the background and you give new comparison. Respondents chooses. And then eventually you arrive to the point when the differences between the the midpoints, this is so you see M4 and M3, the difference between midpoints becomes very small. This is the required precision. So in our case, it's 1.5, where, for example, the survey, the researcher doesn't believe it, may, it makes more sense to go more precise, however it's possible, and says, okay, so the given required level of precision is achieved. We said that the median is the new midpoint, and in this case, it is almost 12%, so 11.9. Then, uh, so remember this was the whole space. So then the new interval is set for 25 percentile, right? And this is from the lower bound till the median. And the experiment of partitioning, the choice between the two intervals is continued. And normally this is of course shorter because this interval is of course much shorter. And then the same operation is, uh, uh, Using the same operation, the uh, 75 percentiles also calculated using the same partitioning chain uh, choice method. As a result, uh, researchers receive distribution, actually, uh, which has 25 percent percentile, 75 fifth percentiles, uh, well-defined median. Um, and more details are possible. The, um, each bin contains 25% math, and um, uniform distribution is assumed within a bin, which is, of course, an assumption. But as I said, more partitioning is possible if one believes there is more heterogeneity in these bins. So <clears throat> this is basically the description of the method. The question is, it is if it is practical method, and to establish this, um, we had a survey. Uh, we ran this survey on the sample of UK respondent. It was general population. We used prolific panel, which is uh, used for many uh, academic research purposes. The number of participants was 811, uh, and it was online survey. Survey included four groups. So there were two bin method groups, Alamansky, for comparison. One is just exactly the one which is used in Bender's Bank all online panel, very similar to what New York Fed does, or uh, Bank of Canada, or, or Survey of Consumer Expectations. 
Another one was very similar method, but with shift of the bins around the uh, point prediction. So this method was implemented, for example, for Central Bank of Turkey, where they, of course, have very high volatile inflation, so the standard procedure doesn't work. And then we had two versions of our method, one with endogenous number of steps, where the um, respondents could go as far as they needed to, they till, they till they achieved this required precision level. And another one um, version, we fixed the number of steps at two. Just running forward, I must say this endogenous uh, method and fixed uh, steps uh, method they, at the end, were very, very similar because the average number of steps in the endogenous method was still indeed two steps. So data from this survey was collected in September 2023. And just for the reference, at that moment, uh, the latest number for CPI fr from UK Statistic Office was 6.3. So <clears throat> just a little bit ag again, another word about survey structure. Um, there were some differences, obviously, right? So first we had instruction uh, which were the same for all the groups. So when we had point prediction, which was again same the groups. And then there were, of course, differences depending on the method. So bin method had one screen with entries as standard and midpoint methods had several sequences of the screen where obviously the respondent had to make their choices. So this is how it looked. First, uh, so this is midpoint question. So first the uh, respondent had to give maximum and minimum. Uh, and the uh, word in words, please give us uh, the maximum rate of inflation where you think that there is absolutely no chance that the inflation rate will be lower or higher respectively. Then they were asked this, so they were shown this screen and they were asked to choose between two intervals, which one they think more likely, so it's really a simple fast click, and, and so on and so forth. So now uh, we analyze this data and the first question, of course, again, practicability. How you can see, if you can see from this table, first uh, we asked respondents about perceived difficulty and perceived length. And the first what you see is that whether it is two-step method, right? This is where we cut steps at two. Whether it is endogenous method, perceived difficulties is, if anything, at least lower than for the Bins method. And perceived length is the same. So despite multiple number of screens, the choice seems to be fast and easy. And therefore, um, respondents don't perceive it as longer or more difficult. Indeed, also, we, we timed the answering, and you can see that uh, for the method, uh, respondents spent less time on the um, midpoint method, independent of the version, than on a bin method. And also, time taken for the whole survey um, is uh, at least not longer for the midpoint method than for the bin method, and actually somewhat shorter. Right, and then we of course analyze the results on the elicited moments. And the first and the very striking thing you can see is that implied mean for the midpoint method is very similar to actually realized inflation and very similar to the bin shift method. Just to remind you, this bin shift method is uh, centered around point prediction. And if actually this is one of my favorite results because in the midpoint method, we never ever ask us to give a number, right? Which actually suggests that eliciting by this simple comparison, people arrive at the very similar number that they have actually in their mind. As you can see for the bin method, so for our benchmark, we have slower, uh, we have lower implied mean forecast, right? So it's really about 1% point lower. Um, if we look at the disagreement, uh, we see a slightly more disagreement of using midpoint methods than beans and beans shift method, which would suggest again that bean methods uh, guide respondents towards toward certain numbers and in the um, midpoint method, we would like to argue they can express their beliefs freer. And one of the most striking results is the differences in uncertainty. Midpoint methods, um, Using midpoint method, we arrive at much lower um, 
individual uncertainties and using the bin shift method. Um, so it's difficult to say if it is good thing. This is just um, the fact, <laughs> basically the finding. Uh, but what we also see is that the differences are strongest with uh, the benchmark, uh, the standard bin method. Uh, the methods are somewhat similar to the bin shift method. Um, and uh, there are strong suggestions that um, these differences are driven by the bin structure. So um, in the next step, so one way to check um, the results, we uh, correlated the point estimate. You remember we asked point estimate from every respondent and we correlate these results with implied, uh, I mean, from the forecast. And you see that uh, the strongest correlation is, of course, for bin shift method, because again, it's shifted again point estimate, but second strongest is for the uh, midpoint and the lowest uh, among all those still, of course, statistically significant and large is for the um, Mansky bin method. Um, so we are actually told to talk today about the probabilities of deflation and uh, what, what it does it mean if these uh, uh, forecasts are realistic. And uh, so again, at that point of time, it was still high inflation, right? In the UK, it was 6%. And what we find that using uh, the midpoint method, uh, the share of, uh, so, so probability must, in, in the deflation, assigned to the deflation scenario is between 1.4 and almost 3%, whereas using beans, it's between 13% for, for, for the standard method and 7% 7, 7 using bin shift method. So one could, of course, build different theories why it is, but um, our preferred explanation is that bin structure actually suggest to the respondent that it shows which possibilities are there and, and otherwise they don't really th seem to think about these scenarios that much at least. Right, and the last result I would show you is um, correlation with the durable consumption, well, plants spending on durable goods. And you can see here that the strongest negative relation is with a midpoint endogenous method. And somehow it has uh, this natural feeling about it well, because when we ask respondents to think over and over again and compare the intervals, one think really about their own prediction. And then it seems to be very logical that this is also connected with their intentions to spend. Um, the, therefore, we would like to argue that two step uh, that, uh, midpoint method performs very well also in this aspect. And to conclude, we propose a new method to measure a full distribution of expectations, inflation expectations particular, but actually any beliefs involving uncertainty. This method doesn't anchor to any exogenous structure, doesn't use bin, or is not uh, lead, uh, isn't led by the um, uh, research as much as other methods. This is perceived to be easy. Uh, this requires very low cognitive, um, uh, it imposes very low cognitive demands on the respondents and can be used in any context also for comparison between the countries with very high inflation, with very low inflation and across times. And if we think about possible application, so any application is of course possible, but um, I'm actually very excited about this idea to think about country with high and volatile inflation where, we may, where maybe there is a very high heterogeneity education and level. We can think about India, but we also can think, for example, in Turkey, and indeed right now experiment in Turkey is planned and we are very much looking forward to results and how it will perform there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Olga. Um, before I open the floor, um, allow me maybe to also ask you a question. So I was wondering um, if you had thought about how this method would, let's say, perform in a, in a panel survey where respondents also, uh, let's say, after a few uh, waves, also learn how to take, uh, take the survey. Um, um, but let me now open the floor. 
a little bit. Uh, first of all, yeah, very interesting paper, uh, very interesting method. Um, in computing the time it takes to answer the questions, um, do you include the questions asking for the minimum and the maximum? Because it looks like you need them, right, for to set up the, okay. Um, then you yeah, the finding of the sensitivity to uh, where the bins are located um, is interesting too. Uh, when we did we did randomizations before and we did not find much sensitivity, but that was in the time when inflation was lower. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, finding that you you find this sensitivity. Um, and then um, if I understood correctly, so the the method really aims at getting the four quartiles, right? And then you rely on uniform distribution um, to kind of fit other things like the deflation probability. So yeah, I, I was wondering about that part um, because if you're interested in tail risk, then, you know, assuming a uniform distribution, basically, you know, if that bin is very big, you, you get very little weight, you know, you basically that's why you get like only 1% deflation, I think. Um, mm -hmm. and, and finally, you know, I think the ultimate question with, you know, studying this, this uh, issue is, you know, what, what are people's true beliefs? We can't really tell which one actually is a better description of people's beliefs. We don't know what, what they really believe. Um, so one way is to look at decisions and set up some kind of an experiment or, you know, see how people make decisions and whether it better reflects, you know, which expectations better reflect their beliefs that lead to those decisions. That's maybe one way to get at it, but yeah, very interesting, very interesting paper. Thank you. Very, very interesting approach. I was wondering how much of the difficulty of the bin approach depend also on the necessity to add up all the probability and make sure they, they add up to 100. Because it would be interesting to compare your methods to a simplified bin approach where you have an automatic calculation telling you uh, how much you need to write to 100%. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Tarun Ramadur, I'm Imperial. Um, what I'm curious about is, um, the di so this is like an optimal design problem to elicit the distribution from people. Uh, to what extent is the optimal design different if people suffer from contrast effects? So for example, suppose you show three different pieces of information. This is classic salient stuff that these guys have been doing, you know, paper after paper. But basically the idea is if I introduce a third dominated option, it sort of pushes people into uh, the middle option. So sometimes firms will introduce a high price product, uh, which is extremely high priced, and then suddenly people start choosing things. Now, I understand you have bivariate comparisons, but it might be worthwhile understanding to what extent the manipulation interacts with people's pre-existing preferences to generate particular outcomes. Uh, hi, uh, Giacomo Mangiante, Banco Vitali. Uh, I had kind of a related question. Uh, how do you think your method perform uh, when it comes to information treatment, uh, agents are more or less anchored to the previous mean and max, or it's more about just shifting the probability distribution? Uh, thank you. Because I guess it, it's a big problem not to ask the same question twice, but if you show that uh, with, your metal agent, mm -hmm. with your method agents are more flexible in adjusting expectation with less effort, um, I guess that would be a huge improvement. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you again for your mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. Shall I start answering? Yeah. Otherwise, I will forget. So, first of all, thank you so very much for all your interest and questions. They, these are very, very helpful because we actually will have to rewrite the paper for submission. About per panel survey learning, um, it's of course speculative what I can say, right? Because we didn't try it yet in a panel. But um, so, I myself part of the Bundesbank panel and I know that we have quite a bit of learning uh, when answering the BIM question. Also myself when I have to test the questionnaire every month I know how to fill it, it very fast. And there I would say the opportunities for learning are much higher because you can put 
just 100% in one bin. Uh, we're comparing to their uh, chain method, where the, uh, the only choice would be just to give smaller intervals so you converge faster, because otherwise you just go through the procedure. Um, therefore, I would say that it may be a little bit forced that learning is a little bit uh, potentially less in the uh, midpoint method than in the bin method. Now, uh, do, uh, Libert, to your questions. Uh, do we include min max time? We do, but also I showed that there is really no dis differences if we time the whole survey, right? Which includes everything, the parts which are the same for, for the respondent as well, all the parts which are different. So the results hold. Um, Concerning the tail risk, this is very important and it's a very interesting question. So as I already mentioned several times, more partitions are absolutely possible, right? So if you are interested in a tail risk, specifically I think in this particular time, in this particular setting, tail risks are more important. One can do that. This is, this is certainly not an issue. Um, Concerning the deflation, the share of the people expecting deflation, as you remember, we ask minimum and maximum, right? So the share of the deflation is really a lot in those minimum realizations, right? And it's already quite a few. Therefore, uh, concerning true beliefs, you're absolutely right. We do not know and we do not observe anyhow what people believe and actually um, in our revision the editor suggested that we do experiment where we know we research know the distribution and we try to see how this method versus the bin method predicts the known distribution i hope we can we can let you know afterwards how it works um stefan so about um uh, 100%, so whether the question, uh, the, whether the problem is that uh, respondents have to sum up uh, the probabilities to 100%. So at least in the Bundesbank um, distribution, they are told when it is not 100% and then they are asked to resubmit the number so it actually sums up to 100%. The variation with showing you how many percent you have left is very interesting and we should try it, but I would think that would force or actually imply to the respondent, oh, you have 20% more, you need to swiftly put it somewhere, right? So um, the precision of the answer would be probably potentially jeopardized. Now, Tarun, this is a very good question about uh, optimal design and uh, manipulation. We should certainly try it. I, I cannot give you the answer. I can imagine it will influence, certainly it will influence the maximum and minimum, and then depending on partition, it may, it may influence the answer. It's very interesting. And RCT information treatment, this is indeed the great question. And again, in uh, revision, we plan to do that. Actually, we are now planning the survey where we'll, we'll have our RCT, and post-RCT will be also uh, post-measure, post including uncertainty, will be collected with midpoint methods versus bin method. And I hope we can reiterate on the paper and we can inform you better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Uh, I'm afraid there are more questions, but maybe we can leave them for, uh, for the break. Um, so thanks a lot to the three of you for making this a uh, very interesting uh, uh, session. And before we move to coffee, let's give them a nice round of applause.